from downtown Milwaukee, welcome to Money Talk with Bob Landis. Each week, professional advisors from Landis and Company Investments discuss the latest financial developments, offering timely insight and long-term perspective. This is Money Talk for June 16th, 2023. Check in the calendar. It's the Brewers and the Pittsburgh Pirates this weekend at AmFam. And it's Taco Fest Saturday at Summerfest Grounds. And it's also Lakefront Festival of the Arts this weekend. And one more, Pet Walk Milwaukee, Saturday at Veterans Park. And coincidentally, today is also National Ugly Dog Day. <laughs> <laughs> of course, no one really has an ugly dog, at least one they'll admit to. Let's get started in Australia, which is becoming the new Florida. It has a wild hog problem, and we're not talking about Harley Davidson's. <laughs> Australia has 24 million feral or wild pigs. An Aussie newspaper reports a wild hog stole 18 cans of beer, got drunk, started a fight with a cow, and passed out under a tree. <laughs> Sounds like it could be a Harley thing. <laughs> or a Florida thing. <laughs> <laughs> and one more for the land down under. A wild brawl in an airport has been caught on camera. And we have a variation on the theme of, here, hold my beer. It's turned into, here, hold my baby. One woman appears to hand her baby off to a friend so she could join in the brawl. (laughs) Crikey. (laughs) Still one more from Australia. A robot pizza delivery startup that raised almost a half a billion dollars has shut down after a series of technological setbacks. The investment for, for the robots that bake, assemble, and deliver pizza What they couldn't figure out was how to keep the cheese from sliding off while it was baking in the self-driving delivery truck. (laughs) How about taking the turns a little slower, Sparky? (laughs) (laughs) And finally, orcas are more commonly known as killer whales. They've sunk three boats and damaged 20 more off the coast of Portugal. The female leader of the whale pod appears to be teaching the other whales to do the same. Well, marine biologists theorize the female orca had a traumatic experience with a boat and she's telling all of her whale buddies about it and how to get even. To quote about quote Bob Dylan, ain't it just like a woman? <laughs> you can address your letters of disapproval to Bob Dylan. <laughs> 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 On the podcast today, we have Art Rothschild, Tom Pappenfuss, Joel Driesing, and wrapping up the week, here's Kyle Tedding. Well, thanks, Max. A good intro for a good week. The NASDAQ up 3.2%, closing at the bell at 13,690. The S&P up 2.6%. Closing at the bell above 4,400, closed at 4,410 this week. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average closing up 1.3% for the week, up at 34,301 for the year. That Dow Jones Industrial Average, again, a fairly poor measure of kind of the broad economic activity that's going on, up just 4.5%. But the S&P up 15.6%, and the NASDAQ an incredible 31.3%. You know what, I think. We can start with the easy one this week, and that's the Fed. They met Tuesday and Wednesday. There was a lot of conversation, a lot of betting on uh, would they, will they, when will they, how are they going to, um, you know, do we call it a pause, do we call it a skip? I think for all intents and purposes, it's a good sign that they're willing to continue to look at the data and understand what is the data telling us. And so on Wednesday, we got the Fed saying, hey, we're going to hold off on raising rates, but let's leave open the, open the possibility that we do some more down the road. Yeah. Uh, Chairman Powell, a few weeks ago when I was on the show, we had a discussion. I was praising the Federal Reserve. Uh, this is another example of why I think the guy running the show, Chairman Powell, is just absolutely brilliant. Um, everybody knew, you know, despite the speculation, would they or wouldn't they, for the most part, we knew there was going to be a pause. And your comment about, well, is it a pause, a skip, what the heck is it? They made it pretty clear that we're not done. They're not done doing what they're going to do, which is to defeat um, inflation. Um, To me, the more interesting thing is how far they've come. I mean, inflation is half of what it was. It only took them a year. And and so many people were accusing them that they were starting late. So I, I... kind of like what they're doing. I like the fact that it is whatever it is. And the pause is appropriate because there's some concerns out there still about the banking system, for example. And and I don't think the concern should be as strong as some people might suggest. But the underlying fact is that the underlying strength of the economy is so strong 
that the Fed is going to have to continue to raise interest rates. The market's beginning to accept the fact that they're going to keep interest rates higher, you know, for longer. And so this pause just gives them the opportunity to say, hey, we've got to look at, like you suggested, more data. And the stuff I've read, the stuff you've read suggests the data is not going to be that much different. Nothing dramatic is going to happen in a month. But this was his way to get a compromise, you know, with those on the Federal Reserve, you know, voting members that otherwise wanted him to raise now. He said, hey, just cool it. You know, we're going to pause here. We'll talk to you next month. And I think that's what the market is clearly expecting. And Dar, we've talked about the psychology of this before, too. But, I mean, it would have defeated the purpose if he would have said, we're done now. We're going to start. Lowering interest rates, right? right I mean, so right, so right. so even if they have no plans, which I don't know if they for sure, who knows if they for sure have plans to keep raising rates. But even if they don't have those, you might as well say we're still thinking about it, right? Absolutely, it's, it's data dependent. Yeah. You know, they have to they have to you know see the numbers come out suggesting that inflation is way down or economic activity is um, slowing. But that's another interesting one. Everyone, you know, a year ago was thinking we were going to have a recession. You brought it up a couple of weeks ago. More and more you're reading things about not, not a lot of language, but the possibility that we're going to have a soft landing um, or no landing, which hasn't been mentioned in recent weeks. Um, so there's so much underlying strength that I'm not so sure we're going to have a recession. That's my own personal view, at least not in the near future. And so they may be able to pull off something that's very hard to do, which is bringing down inflation while not having a recession, which could be an incredibly good thing and another reason why stocks are probably going up. I think, you know, to add into this conversation, when I talk with clients about this and this constant guessing game of what are we going to do and being data dependent, is I, I think my, my interpretation is that Federal Reserve already having, I don't know, pie in their face a couple times now from their, their whole, this whole policy and then kind of moving forward. I think they kind of go back to, you know, the inflation issues of the late 70s and what happened then when they tried to lower rates too soon and inflation came back. So I think it's more a matter of how can we be the least wrong? And so I think that is kind of the general approach that they're taking with this is that at least if we pause and we keep the language as the market digests every single <laughs> nuance and word and verbiage, um, that I think that's the side they kind of err on, is that they're always going to be more to the side of, well, we can be less wrong if we keep rates higher for longer, um, rather than signaling a cut at some point in the future, even though the market seems to not believe that. <laughs> well, and Tom, this is a lesson maybe that I took from Art and a few others here, but this time around, and really the last couple times we've we've talked about rate cycles the Fed's communication has been as important as their action. And that's maybe something that was missing in some of those earlier cycles where you got kind of hit by surprise on big rate increases or you weren't really sure what was coming next. Well, the Fed's been quite clear. And in many ways, you know, to Joel's earlier point, I think the language is as much of a tool in shaping expectation. Yeah, they may not even know for sure what they're going to do, but they're going to talk tough because it gives the impression that we'll do whatever it takes. And so I think the, you know, the communication piece has been, as much as anything, part of the, the tools that maybe we didn't count on um, in terms of how the Fed is going to fight inflation. You know, Art, you mentioned kind of the, the economy being stronger than maybe we thought. Um, and as a result, we've seen the market rally begin to broaden. It isn't just the five or six names that it was, you know, maybe the first four months of the year. Really, since mid-May, we've had much better participation in the market rally than what we've seen. Yeah, the NASDAQ is still far and away the leader, but all of a sudden, the Dow's up four and a half. And we were talking about a Dow that was mostly flat up until two or three weeks ago. The S&P up 15 and a half percent. You know, I'm encouraged by the fact that it isn't just one or two names anymore. Yeah, and it doesn't seem inappropriate that we're that we're rallying because of that change in perspective um, on the part of investors. Investor sentiment has turned positive for the first time uh, in months. That's a good thing. Uh, money's flowing into the markets, but it's not the irrational exuberance we had decades ago. Although, as the market goes higher, it does run contrary to what the Fed is trying to do, which is to slow things. But I think things are going to keep going anyway because of all the jobs that have been brought back 
uh, to this country. But again, that Dow being only up 4.5%, I think there's running room there. That means that there is an opportunity for more gains, for further broadening. Um, as small caps, you know, which have done nothing all year, all of a sudden rallied this week. Um, so I continue to be encouraged by what I'm seeing. And then for the first time in a long time, the words fear of missing out showed up. Um, that's something we hadn't heard for a year, year and a half. And so some investors are going to be throwing money at this thing. Oh, yeah, I got to get in. Um, I don't want to miss this. Yeah, I think as you look at the opportunity set, if it's a few names, you're probably going to miss. Because at any point in time, it could be names that you aren't even thinking about. When the market as a whole is rising, now everybody's benefiting. And I think it takes some realistic expectations for modest economic growth for a lot of businesses in our country to benefit. For industrials or for some of the defensive consumer names, you really do need economic strength for that, for those types of names to get a nice run higher in their stock price. And so I think it's reflective of the fact that investors are coming around to this idea that even if we do hit that dreaded recession, it probably isn't going to be as bad as what we thought. Um, and, you know, Art, as you pointed out, I think a, a greater than not chance now that we navigate this far better than we thought we could. Tom, you know, I think one of the things that comes from this is that we're seeing higher and higher numbers when we look at our portfolios, numbers that maybe we had benchmarked last January 3rd, January 3rd, 2022, as this is what I have, this is what I'm supposed to be worth when I look at my investments. Um, and now we're starting to reintroduce some of those lessons of maybe the best time to measure our portfolios isn't when things are at their best or things are at their worst. Yeah, I mean, I think right now it's just an exercise in patience. I mean, uh, other things we've talked about in the past with clients is, I think, comparing their own portfolio to where the S&P is. And we talked about how narrow it has been uh, at this point. And perhaps maybe some people have felt a little disappointed that, well, if they're if uh, the S&P is up 12, 13, and I'm only up half of that, you know, um, you know, why, why, why not more? And, and so I, I think, I, you know, I constantly talk to clients about not trying to position based on what has happened, but looking where the opportunity and the value is at. Um, to Art's point earlier, I think, you know, when you see growth stocks up 24% year to date, and I see value stocks up two, maybe 3% year to date, um, I'm more in the camp of if you're trying to allocate new dollars and new position, not to follow growth. I mean, how many years have we seen, you know, growth stocks have better than 24% returns in a year? I'd, I'd, it's probably not much. I don't have the numbers, but I doubt it's that high. And so I'm more in the camp that you probably will start to see growth moderate and you'll start to see value uh, start to pick up and blend, uh, you know, continue to do better and more quality names start to do better. Uh, aside from that, I might even, you know, when you kind of compare not only just U.S. stocks, but looking at non-U.S. stocks and venturing into that space, um, you look at valuations are quite attractive. Um, also, highlighting market breadth. Um, so one of the latest kind of statistics I saw was that if you were to look at the S&P 500 as a market cap weighted index, but instead kind of flip the script and make it and turn it into an equal weighted index, so every company's uh, returns um, uh, have the same weight uh, compared to the uh, the Euro stocks 600 index, if if every company has performance has an equal weight in that index, the Euro stocks index is actually up 20% on the year, and the S and P is only up five. Um, and, and so I just think there is potential, a lot of other room for just following, continue to follow those uh, that narrow range of stocks. I think you really want to start to widen out now at this point in time. No, I think those are great points, and you know, as as Art threw out the FOMO, the FOMO fear of missing out. You know, there is this tendency to look at those high flyers and go, I want more of that. Um, and perhaps that's the area to trim, not the area to add to. Uh, Joel, we had quite a bit of, I think, important economic data this week, a short list of releases, but those releases pretty meaningful. One of the big ones that we've been staring at for the last two years is consumer price index. That's right, yeah. So the, and that's the data-driven stuff that, that Art was talking about that the Fed's considering. And it's interesting because we're talking about a strong economy here, but actually the economy is weakening, and that's what's making inflation go down. But that, as Art pointed out, that's what the Fed is trying to do. It's trying to slow things, and I, and I guess it's gr growth, but it's more controlled. 
if if the inflation is lower. So um, and and are suggested. I mean the the consumer price index, which is the broadest measure of inflation, um, that had a year to year rise of four percent in May. Um, that was down from four point nine percent in April. It was as high as it was over nine percent last June. So you know it's it's half of what it was before, but it's still two times higher than what the Fed wants overall, long term. So um, so there's room there for the Fed to keep tightening if it wants to tighten. It, you know, they, they, have, they have that allowance there. And then we get that on producer prices, which was also encouraging, um, maybe even more encouraging in terms of direction for inflation. That's right, yeah. So that that's looking at inflation on the wholesale level. A lot of times that sort of um, precedes what happens on, on the consumer level. Um, and that was down, it was actually negative on a month-to-month basis for the, the third time in four months. Um, that's pretty astounding. And, and, you know, compared to that 4% year-to-year inflation on the consumer level, at the wholesale level, um, it was up just 1.1%. And that's the lowest it's been in two and a half years. And some encouraging signs on kind of the consumer sentiment front, encouraging signs on the retail sales front. I mean, all the, the elements of economic growth are there, more modest than they have been recently, but, but still growth. Right, and the modesty is the thing. I mean, it, you know, as, as I said, it's it's more of a controlled growth in the economy, and and we know that consumer spending drives two thirds of of the gross domestic product. So, yeah, we had the numbers uh, on retailing, and um, what I what I like to look, like to look at in that is if you adjusted for inflation, especially with high inflation lately, um, and it showed that inflation adjusted that retail sales rose. 0.2 percent in May, and that was the first inflation-adjusted increase in four months. So that's progress. That's that's saying that um, you know even adjusting for the higher prices that consumers are out there spending, and they feel a little better than they did the the prior few. That's months. right. Yeah, the consumer sentiment number, and and that's just a preliminary number that we got today from the University of Michigan. But that's the highest it's been in four months. It's up twenty eight percent from where it was a year ago. But a year ago was the lowest it had ever been in I don't know four decades of of measuring consumer sentiment. You know, I think all of this is summarized in more or less the same statement I've given for the last probably six months on the podcast, which is just more signs that inflation is still headed in the right direction, that the economy is still growing, but more slowly than it did the month, the quarter before, um, and signs that there is a way out and that the Fed acknowledges what that is, which is that they'll continue to remain data dependent. So with that, we enjoy doing the show for you, and we'll talk to you again next week. Thank you for listening to Money Talk with Bob Landis. If you have a financial question you want answered on next week's show, email it to moneytalk at landis.com. To keep informed throughout the week, visit our Money Talk page at landis.com. <laughs>